are two major foreign policy stories playing out in the American mainstream media right now. And I don't use that particular phrasing to illuminate how distorted the American mainstream media is in its coverage of international affairs uh, or national affairs or local affairs or anything for that matter. But no, just to point out that there are two truly dominant stories right now going on in the world of American foreign policy. Maybe not the biggest stories in the world, but they are up there and certainly in terms of international significance represent major milestones for humanity. Now, of course, I'm talking about Syria and Korea, where we have an interesting dichotomy in the actions of Donald Trump. And in North Korea, what we have is what seems to be the end of the Korean War, finally. A lot of uh, people are, are looking at this very hopefully, very rightfully so. And uh, I, I don't know if this is one I can really say uh, I told you so on, but in a sense, yes, this is the uh, mark of progress that I have been describing for years and that we see humanity getting more peaceful over time. We see it getting more and more difficult for governments to wage war, especially large scale war. But when in the age of the internet, people look at what's happening in North Korea, not happening now, but what has been the accepted state of affairs of a demilitarized zone of this silly standoff that's been going on for decades, you cannot help but look at this and go, yeah, there's, there's just no way this can be allowed to continue. This is silly. And so to see Trump as president a, at this particular point getting to play the peacemaker, getting to take credit for this, is, is somewhat disturbing. But ultimately, we shouldn't really care. And the story I'd like to share with you from the Associated Press, South Korean leader says Trump can take the Nobel by Hyung Jin Kim. South Korean President Moon Jae-in has shaken off a suggestion that he receive the Nobel Peace Prize, saying that U.S. President Donald Trump can take the Nobel Prize as long as the Koreas receive peace in return. Moon made the comment Monday in response to a suggestion that he received the award by the widow of late South Korean President Kim Dae-jung, who was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2000 after a summit with then North Korean leader Kim Jong-il. So, I, I think this is, you know, a, a very important distinction here between national leaders of governments, I should say, in the rest of the world and those in the United States, where the presidency is a unique product of a very unique population, culture, political culture, and electoral system that leads to candidates like Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama and Mitt Romney and John frickin' McCain dominating that conversation. Whereas in the rest of the world, they say, you know what, Donald Trump can take the peace prize. I don't need it. Now, I don't know, maybe there is something of a, a narcissistic, psychopathic tendency among all political leaders seeking power. But this was actually at least a beautiful moment where he said, you know what, we just want peace, let him have the prize. Moon held a summit with current leader Kim Jong-un last week in which Moon and Kim, the son of Kim Jong-il, walked together across the tense border and agreed to a raft of initiatives meant to ease animosity. Moon responded to the suggestion of Nobel glory by saying, President Trump can take the prize, the only thing we need is peace. South Korea also said Monday that it will remove propaganda broadcasting loudspeakers from the border with North Korea this week as the rivals move to follow through with their leader summit declaration that produced reconciliation steps without a breakthrough in the nuclear standoff. Yeah, it would be kind of funny, right? Like, uh, we're having talks now, but we're still blasting propaganda across the demilitarized zone. Yeah, that, that would have been awkward. That's kind of an automatic thing to come to an end at this point. Now, I, I don't want to get ahead of myself in championing this as, as a, a major step forward for humanity. But it's, it's hard not to see it as a, a hugely positive sign of the times. The two Koreas had been engaged in Cold War era psychological warfare. 
since the North's fourth nuclear test in early 2016. Seoul began blaring anti-North Korean broadcasts and K-pop songs via border loudspeakers in North Korea quickly matched the action with its own border broadcasts and launches of balloons carrying anti-South leaflets. So you see how silly this had gotten, of course. This announcement came a day after it said Kim told Moon during the summit that he would shut down his country's only known nuclear testing site and allow outside experts and journalists to watch the process. South Korean officials also cited Kim as saying he would be willing to give up his nuclear programs if the United States commits to a formal end to the Korean War and pledge not to attack the North. Kim had already suspended his nuclear and missile tests while offering to put his nuclear weapons up for negotiations. Skipping ahead here. The North's parliament adopted a decree to sink its time zone with South Korea's this Saturday. <laughs> as a... Uh, a sworn enemy of daylight saving time here in the United States. It's just quite ironic to see that, yes, government thinks it can manipulate the time also. Now, it might take some major technological leaps, but we are also on our way to one world time, and hopefully a metric system in time as well. In time, we can have a metric system in time. But to Syria. We go to the Los Angeles Times. Trump administration struggles to win Arab support for helping rebuild Syria, leaving U.S. pullout uncertain. Now, just even in the headline, we can see the, the, the propaganda here, but I will explain it in, in a much more obvious way as we get into the story. Trump administration struggles to win Arab support for helping rebuild Syria, leaving U.S. pullout uncertain. There is there's a deeply embedded premise an assumption of propaganda in this headline that the United States can only pull out when everything is set right with the local powers. The United States must maintain a military presence until certain magical fantasy, whatever criteria are met, so that there is an excuse for troops to be in Syria indefinitely. The Trump administration is struggling to assemble a coalition of Arab military forces to replace U.S. troops battling Islamic State militants in eastern Syria, a roadblock that could indefinitely delay President Trump's goal of pulling American forces out of the country, U.S. officials said. Now, just to, to bring this back to practical terms for the average American, they, they don't care. I mean, to an extent, I, I don't care myself what the particulars of the, the empire the U.S. dollar empire, the U.S. federal government, whatever, however you want to describe it, what they are like, the, the, there are U.S. troops battling Islamic State militants in eastern Syria. I got to be honest, I did not know that before reading this story. And I guarantee you most Americans have no idea. There's a sort of resignation to the general idea that the United States military in 2018 is just oh yeah something's going on there's going to be troops there there's going to be american military intervention oh yeah hopefully they don't kill too many people oh yeah well we can do a lot with drone strikes and it's just it's still a major reduction and i and i and i cannot underscore this enough that we are living in the most peaceful times in human history that this is a great mark of human progress that this is the worst the military-industrial complex the American military empire can get away with. Allies in the region are deeply skeptical about sending their troops, and many are even reluctant to contribute funds to help stabilize cities and towns liberated from the Islamic State, according to senior U.S. officials. If the United States intends to pull out, as Trump has threatened, just let that sink in for a second. We're going to threaten to stop using our military against you. It, it, it just, what? It doesn't, it doesn't, I'm sorry, that's, that's not how reality works. I got, I, who, who wrote this piece of garbage? David S. Cloud for the LA Times in Washington. I, you know, it's, it's just, it's, I, I, I don't know if this is even worth doing sometimes. You know, if, if people care enough, if we'll ever have enough listeners or viewers 
for Adam versus the man that, that teasing this out is relevant. But I guess it's important because we need to be providing the alternative to this, at least some alternative media that keeps people, that, that keeps people engaged. But it's, it's going to take you know, either a significant reform or a massive effort and investment at this point. And I know it's happening slowly but surely, but holy crap, people are, are still reading the Los Angeles Times People are still reading New York Times, Washington Post, still watching television news. I know it's it's less and less, but all right. I should I should at least be a little bit more informative and pass on Mr. Cloud's facts. Roughly 2,000 U.S. troops have been working with local fighters in eastern Syria to defeat the Islamic State. The militants' presence east of the Euphrates River has shrunk to a few towns and rural strongholds that are being pounded by U.S.-led airstrikes. Now again, I just I gotta go back to like, wait a second. I, who are we fighting in Syria again? We're fighting. I thought weren't we fighting with? Like, I, see, there I go using that that royal we of of associating with the U.S. government. The U.S. government, the, the the empire is using every excuse to fight on every side to just promote the racket of militarism. None of this is going to have the stated intended effect because it's not supposed to because that would get rid of the excuse for all of this in the first place. We're going to bomb Syria into peace. And if we stop, there's no peace. And if we keep bombing, there's no peace. And if you accept the premise that you can bomb people into a state of peace, well, no shit. This is what you get. But you're going to get away with less and less of it. Or you're going to see less and less of it. There's still the general decline. But what to do once those fighters are defeated remains a matter of stark disagreement between Trump and his advisors, especially at the Pentagon, where officials fear Trump's desire for a rapid troop pullout could enable the militants to regroup and give a freer hand to Russia and Iran. People trying to make shit complicated that doesn't need to be complicated. Bring the troops home. Stop meddling in, in other countries' affairs and the world will be better off for it. Trump's desire for a rapid troop pullout. Yeah, I mean, this guy is still trying to give Trump the benefit of the doubt as if he is a just credible human being. Trump signaled plans for an abrupt U.S. pullout this month when he declared he wanted to remove American troops, quote, very soon. The, no. When the president says, I, I really want to pull troops out soon, but I can't. I really want to stop punching you, little brother. Like, like it's just it's bullshit from a bully. Like, really, do you? Do you? How, Mister? Does Mister Cloud buy this? Does the L.A. Times buy this? Do, do the readers of the L.A. Times buy this? I, I want to call it garbage, but it's not garbage. It's it's very. I, I want to say well thought out. Maybe that's not the case, but you know, well thought in some form, uh, propaganda. But that you, you you believe the president. If, if you believe the president is a credible source, you are not a credible source. So I'm going to skip way ahead on this article because there is something uh, that, that just points this out so directly. And it's going to make you sick if you have any sense of you know the scale of these numbers and the injustice. Although it's not, this is just one element of it. In a meeting Friday in Brussels with Turkish Foreign Minister Mevlut Kavusoglu Pompeo urged Turkey to abide by its promise to reach a negotiated settlement on Monbij's future, according to a senior official who briefed reporters traveling with the new Secretary of State. The U.S. is also discussing offering other inducements to regional allies to help in Syria, such as offering to name Saudi Arabia a major non-NATO ally, a designation held by 16 other countries that widens access to U.S. weapons, sales, and Pentagon stockpiles. Oh! The gravy train rolls on. The United Arab Emirates pledged to contribute $60 million in humanitarian assistance for Syria at a conference this week in Brussels. But U.S. officials say such pledges are largely focused on assisting refugees, not on rebuilding infrastructure and training local police, the tasks considered most vital for stabilizing eastern Syria. As in the, the more big-ticket items that we can fleece the American taxpayers for. Really, anybody in the world who's using the, the U.S. dollar gets ripped off. 
as they print more dollars and the value of the US dollars in your back pocket and your bank accounts lose value. Training local police. Now, this is something I actually have some personal experience with in Iraq. When, when the United... I, well, this is where I get to say we, right? When we went in and so decimated uh, society, basic social functions in Iraq, uh, the, the U.S. military said, well, part of what we're going to do to restore law and order is to train a bunch of police officers. Now, if you know anything about the United States police state and you're an Iraqi, the last people you want training your cops are the Americans. You're going to get a drug war, surveillance state, police state, minorities getting abused on the street, stop and frisk. Yeah, you do not want the Americans exporting their model of law enforcement. But it was a joke. It, it was... Uh, it, we had these BAT systems, biometric automated tool set or something like that, where you could scan the iris and do thumbprint scans. And it was just another multi-million dollar kickback baked into this plan that ended up uh, hiring police who were intimidated out of holding their positions in most cases, and remember this is Fallujah 2004, by insurgents. You, you think somehow magically the United States is going to have a successful police training program in Syria. Sure. Any contributions will mean little if Trump orders an abrupt U.S. withdrawal. Nobody will invest. Hold on, this is, this is the great quote from one of the senior officials. Nobody will invest hundreds of million dollars if they think we are just leaving. It's all quite uncertain. And there you have it. The racket of American foreign policy continues, although over time it does get every day ever so slightly less and less vicious. Thank you to YouTube for hosting this video and for being an essential part of human progress by making video hosting available worldwide to everyone on the internet. However, the next phase in human progress is here with Steemit.com and their video hosting alternative blockchain-based solutions including DTube, and you can find that through steamit.com as well as my own page there, at Adam Kokesh. This is a decentralized blockchain-based social media network that pays you fairly for your content. Already, I'm regularly making more there with a single post than I do from an entire month on YouTube. So please join us on the next frontier of the information revolution at steamit.com. And if you want help getting a leg up there, I'm happy to re-steam your posts and make sure that no one is starting from scratch. Just email me one of your favorite posts at adam at thefreedomline.com and we'll share it on my feed.